So, as we all know, the royal family has been thrown into crisis. Meghan and Harry's very public split with them has revealed much of what we already know. The royal family are a racist, self-serving and vengeful element of the establishment. In the monarchy, we have a living monument to all of Britain's crimes, one that sits at the very heart of political and public life. It is an institution steeped in that history, but more than a monument. In the monarchy, the British ruling class have a weapon for the defense of their privilege and power. This fallout is more than just a very British soap opera, though, and it's also more than very, the very real racism that Meghan has experienced. The nature of this episode highlights the deepening divisions forming within the ruling class and a serious crisis for the British ruling class as their reserve weapon is damaged potentially beyond repair. So as I'm sure most of you know, the monarchy has been around for nearly a thousand years and at least 350 years too long. Unlike the French Revolution, the English Revolution failed to get rid of the aristocracy even after the long war waged against it and the execution of Charles I. After 10 years of a republic, which I only just discovered we had while I was making the research for this talk, um, the monarchy was resurrected in a zombified form. The bourgeoisie decided that it could actually be useful to keep them around, and so made an agreement for the return of Charles II on condition that there would be no return to absolutism. As could be expected from them, the Stuarts broke the agreement and were duly ousted by a coup d'etat, which placed William III, a Dutch adventurer, on the front. For the next 150 years, though, the monarchy was full of upheavals and scandals, and for most of that time, the monarchy was anything but popular. The Economist exposed the myth of the thousand-year monarchy as, as follows. The monarchy may have lasted a thousand years, but until recently, the British have only occasionally treated it with reverence. The current royal family, like the Hanoverians before them, are as much German as British. In fact, George V invented the family name Windsor after his favourite castle in 1917 at the height of the First World War, when the family's name, Saxe, Coburg and Gotha had caused grumbling. Furthermore, when describing Queen Victoria's coronation in 1838, contemporary accounts said, journalists and the public showed little respect for monarchs themselves. On the death of George IV in 1830, the Times declared in an editorial that there was never an individual less regretted by his fellow creatures. Cartoonists attacked the monarch in a manner which would look savage even today. Victoria was no more popular than her predecessors until her apotheosis near the end of her reign. She was at various times scornfully, returned to, scornfully referred to as Mrs. Melbourne for her partiality to her first prime minister, or Mrs. Brown for her partiality to her servant, John Brown. A long retirement after the death of Albert was bitterly resented. In 1864, an advertisement was pinned to the railings of Buckingham Palace by some wag. These premises to be left or sold in consequence of the late occupants declining business. She was regularly attacked in newspaper articles, but by the mid 1860s, republicanism was becoming widely discussed and even fashionable. Republican clubs were springing up throughout the country in the following decade. The monarchy seemed to be heading for the dustbin of history. Only at the end of Victoria's reign and the beginning of the 20th century did the ruling class take steps to build up the institution of the monarchy, lavishing large sums of money on huge spectacles such as Victoria's Golden Jubilee in 1887. Most of the present day ceremonial pantomimes, which most people imagine to be ancient British traditions, date from this time. Quoting the Economist again, long forgotten medieval rituals were dragged out of the attic, dusted off and performed such as the investiture of the Prince of Wales in 1911. New ones were invented, the Royal Broadcast in 1932. When the public began to get bored even with this in the 1960s, the cameras were invited into Buckingham Palace. Paradoxically, paradoxically, what saved the monarchy was the widening of the franchise and universal male suffrage. The ruling elite, the economist admits, forced to widening the voting franchise, decided that the country needed the monarchy as a symbol of stability, and they needed it to help them retain control of the government. It's necessary to understand that the monarchy is not simply a harmless relic with no powers. It is an important reserve weapon of reaction. The Queen has significant reserve powers which can be brought into play at a time of national crisis. Such powers would undoubtedly have been used against a left Labour government 
that attempted to challenge the power and privileges of the big banks and monopolies that own and control most of Britain. Although most people do not realize it, this is the main role of the monarchy and the reason why it has been kept in being by the ruling class for so long. It's worth spending a certain amount of hard cash on ceremony and glitter in order to divert attention away from the real state of affairs. It is essential that the masses believe in the monarchy and therefore this is a worthwhile investment just like any other. It's also a necessary insurance policy in case things go badly wrong. Unlike other countries, Britain does not have a written constitution and most laws are based upon custom and practice. But for that very reason, there are many gray areas. For example, what would happen in the case of an elected government which attempted to take over the banks and monopolies? After all, the army swears an oath of allegiance to the ruling monarch, not to the elected parliament. The Queen's signature is necessary before any decision of parliament becomes law. By withholding her signature, the Queen would automatically provoke a constitutional crisis. Whom would the army, police and civil service obey? In other words, we would have all the conditions for a legal coup. The Queen could suspend Parliament and rule through the Privy Council, an organ of state which is not often referred to but prefers to remain in the shadows, until a national emergency gives it a green light to show its real face. Trotsky wrote on this saying, Royalty is weak as long as the bourgeois Parliament is the instrument of bourgeois rule, and as long as the bourgeoisie has no need of extra parliamentary methods. But the bourgeoisie can, if necessary, use royalty as the focus of all extra parliamentary, i.e. real forces directed against the working class. In such a moment when the reserve powers of the monarchy are finally wheeled out, it is imperative that the monarchy should, should command the un, unswerving obedience of a large part of society. This is the real reason for the maintenance of the monarchy and all the mystique that at least until recently surrounded it. Walter Baycott summed this up, this, up this importance of secrecy in his famous work, The English Constitution. A secret prerogative is an anomaly, perhaps the greatest of anom 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 anomalies. Apologies. That secrecy is, however, essentially to the utility of English royalty as it now is. Above all things, our royalty is to be reverent, and if you begin to poke about it, you cannot reverence it. When there is a select committee on the Queen, the charm of royalty will be gone. Its mystery is its light. We must not let daylight upon magic. We must not bring the Queen into the combat of politics, or she will cease to be reverenced by all combatants. She will become one combatant among many. And there are countless examples of royal interference, as I'll explain. And let's not forget that the top judges, police chiefs, heads of military, heads of civil service, etc., are all part of the upper echelons of the British state. While only 7% of the population have attended private school, this, is, this rises dramatically to 71% of senior judges, 62% of senior armed forces officers, 54% of Whitehall permanent secretaries, and 50% of members of the House of Lords. In this way, they are groomed for their elite role as determined defenders of the capitalist system and facilitators of reaction. So some examples of where these powers have been used. Firstly, in 1931, Ramsay MacDonald, the then Labour Prime Minister, deserted the Tories and Liberals to form a national government. He stood for the national interest. The national interest, of course, being the interest of big business. He and the few other Labour MPs who split to form the national government had the full backing of the ruling class. King George V was very much a part of the plot to form the national government. MacDonald and the leaders of the opposition party were in constant touch with the palace, which acted as a broker. In a strict constitutional capacity, he, the king, has rendered a signal service to his people, noted the Times. In 1931, the king met both Stanley Baldwin, the Tory leader, and Sir Herbert Samuel, the liberal leader, to discuss the national interest. Sir Herbert cynically informed the king, in view of the fact that the necessary economies would prove most unpalatable to the working classes, it would be to the general interest if it could be imposed by a Labour government. If that failed, a national government headed by MacDonald would be the next best option. MacDonald's former colleagues were stunned by the speed of events. They had all seen the need for sacrifices in a balanced budget, but had been kept in the dark. When the split came, right-wingers Henderson and Klein did not follow MacDonald, but remained inside the Labour Party to prevent it falling into the wrong hands. While the Labour leaders wept over the great loss to the Labour movement, the rank and file forced the national executive to expel MacDonald and the other traitors from the party. 
1968 with Howard Wilson, the establishment was paranoid about a red threat. As a result, MI5 and military top brass plotted a coup involving the planned seizure of Heathrow Airport, the BBC and Buckingham Palace. Once Wilson was deposed, Lord Mountbatten, uncle to Prince Philip, would become acting prime minister. Queen would then come out in support of the new law and order government. This plot was confirmed by different sources. The former intelligence officer, Brian Crozier, described how army tops seriously considered the possibility of a takeover. Unbeknownst to Prime Minister Harold Wilson, military manoeuvres took place at Heathrow, allegedly directed against an unspecified terrorist threat. Wilson spoke darkly of two military coups which he said had been planned to overthrow his government in the late 1960s and in the mid-1970s. Both were said to involve high-ranking elements in the British Army eager to see the back of Labour government. Both involved a member of the royal family, Prince Louis Mountbatten. In 1975, there was an Australian coup. Among the many of the Queen's powers include being able to dismiss an elected government from office. We're led to believe that such powers only exist in theory, that they are a relic of a feudal past that someone carelessly forgot to remove. In fact, these powers have not been forgotten about. They are simply held back to be used as a last roll of the dice for the ruling class. For example, they were used in the constitutional crisis in Australia to remove the elected Labour government of Gough Whitman on the 11th of November 1975. As head of the Commonwealth, the British Crown was able to intervene for its representative, Governor General Sir John Kerr. Sir John then commissioned the leader of the opposition, Malcolm Fraser of the Liberal Party, to act as a caretaker Prime Minister. The Queen acted in both her royal persona as the Queen of Australia and the Queen of the United Kingdom in order to see through this coup against the Labour government. People in Australia assumed that the Queen exercised no residual monarchical power over their system of government, but they were wrong. It shows the shady constitutional, shadowy constitutional powers of the British monarchy which can be used whenever they see fit, even to dismiss a democratically elected government. And just a couple of years ago, we saw Boris Johnson prorogue Parliament. Johnson's decision to prorogue Parliament created a unique crisis for the Queen, stated Graham Smith of the Campaign Group Republic. The convention is that the Queen does as she's told by the PM, but in normal times, the PM has the full support of a majority in the, in the Commons. Constitutionally, the Queen is free to decide whether or not to go along with the government plans and support the sovereign parliament. So the Queen had a choice to make, and she was damned if she did and damned if she didn't. In other words, if the Queen had rejected Johnson's request to suspend parliament, she would have been vilified for imposing her own position on Brexit. By doing so, she would have shattered the myth of the monarch's political neutrality. But by accepting Johnson's request, she has also revealed how an unelected head of state can be used as a tool by a minority government in Parliament to bypass the scrutiny of Britain's elected representatives. This short-term move by Boris Johnson alarmed many parts of the ruling class and highlighted how the current Tory party are no longer under their control. By drawing the Queen into the public eye, he damaged the secrecy of the monarchy and its position above politics. And then I'm sure we recently saw the revelations by The Guardian of how often the monarchy have interfered with policy. It turns out on no less than 1,062 occasions, civil servants saw as it their humble duty to seek the Queen's consent for proposed laws before they were allowed to go before Parliament. Moreover, it would seem from the newspaper's investigations that old Queen Liz was either threatened to or has actually withheld her consent on multiple occasions. And the bills in question, any bills that could affect the Queen's interests or those of her estate, the Duchy of Lancaster. The sworn Prince Charles has demanded the same courtesy for any proposed legislation that would affect his not insubstantial interests. The bills vetted over the years include a 1968 road safety bill, which excludes the royal estate, a 2006 animal welfare bill, excluding inspectors from royal premises, and, proposed, and the proposed transparency law, which the monarch succeeded in again excluding herself from ensuring the vast scale of her private wealth remains a secret. And so for generations under the empire, wide layers of British society, not only the middle class, but also sections of the working class, were under the influence of the monarchy. But in the period of Britain's decline, all the old traditions of civility have gradually fallen away. New generations are no longer willing to accept the rule of their alleged betters as some God -given, something God-given and natural. This process has been going on for some time, but sometimes it takes an accidental event to act as the society catalyst, 
which, as in chemistry, serves to accelerate enormously a tendency which was already present. The death of Diana saw an explosion of popular feeling. What was sorrow turned to anger, and this was directed at the monarchy for their remoteness and disdain for Diana. This all happened in a period of anger and frustration at the political system. 18 years of Tory rule had just been ended, but the consequences of it instilled a revolutionary current under the surface. Labour had just won a landslide as a result of Tory disintegration, and it was Blair who came to the rescue of the monarchy, advising the Queen to speak to the public and proudly announcing himself as supporter of the monarchy in order to shield this reserved weapon from destruction. Now with Meghan and Harry, we once again see the monarchy's reputation coming under threat. The media are closing ranks to defend the reactionary power at all costs. And the BBC reported at the weekend, weekend that Buckingham Palace is about to re is reviewing diversity policies across all royal households. So I don't know how you diversify hereditary uh, monarchy. Having stood up to racism in huge numbers at the mass BLM protests last year, young people see in the treatment of the Sussexes as just one more instance of the rotten institutional racism at the heart of the British establishment. Worryingly for the British ruling class, there was a growing disgust towards the monarchy growing amongst the youth. According to one YouGov poll, only 13% of 18 to 24 year olds believe that Harry and Meghan have been treated fairly by the royal family. A massive 61% believe they've been treated unfairly. Only among the over 65 did upward of 50% of respondents say they felt the couple had been treated fairly. Lenin pointed out that the first condition for a revolution was a split in the ruling class. The tensions building up in the recesses of society find their first expression not in a movement of the masses, but in conflicts, crises, and divisions at the top. The rulers of society feel the pressure from below, and one section senses that they cannot continue to rule in the old way, while another wing stubbornly resists change, fearing to open the floodgates. The split in the monarchy has now assumed an open and embittered character and is reflective of the pressures growing in society, particularly amongst the youth who are growing in their insistence for an end to this rotten capitalist system. So I hope I've, I've clearly explained the role of the monarchy as a reserve weapon of the ruling class. This weapon has now been seriously dented, but it is not yet completely destroyed. It still has important reserves of support in the masses, therefore the ruling class will do everything in its power to prop it up. We have entered an entirely new and turbulent period in Britain and on a world scale. The socialist transformation of society will once more be placed firmly on the order of the day. By whatever means, the ruling class will attempt to maintain the monarchy as a weapon against the labour movement and a bulwark against social progress. The task of removing this obstacle, along with the House of Lords and all the other accumulated rubbish left over from feudalism, will be the prior condition of success for a revolutionary leadership and party is not content to accept the dictates of capitalism, but is determined to abolish it.